Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dominic Pyack, and I'm with Arduino. And I'm here today with my colleague, Keith Jackson, and we're going to do a webinar on Arduino in IoT applications, talking a little bit about the MKR family of hardware and the different commercial apps that we've seen that users implement them into. So, Keith, you want to say a couple of words? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm from Arduino. I work in our marketing team. So very pleased that you could all attend our webinar today. Thank you. All right, so let me get these slides up. So hopefully this is going to work. Give me a second here. All right, so hopefully the slides are up in front of you now. So let's move straight along. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to be giving you an introduction to how we view IoT, the types of hardware that we've got which are being implied in those types of systems, the sensor hardware that has been integrated with them, and also we've got elements that allow you to retrofit into RS-485, CAN, or Ethernet-based systems out there. We'll talk a little bit about software and the quickest way to get started developing that around these components. We'll also touch on security, which is a very important topic for IoT. And finally, we'll be talking about how to connect those devices to the cloud. So both Arduino's IoT cloud, but also third-party clouds from the likes of Microsoft or Google. And so most of you have probably heard of Arduino before, but more in the context of the, the classic Arduino Uno. And Arduino's mission is uh, to enable anyone to innovate by making complex technology simple to use. And what we found over the, the past years is that Arduino Uno is increasingly being used in more commercial applications. And what we did by taking um, feedback from customers who were using it is work out how we can create products which are more suitable for commercial use. But just to give you a, an idea of the scale of the user base we have right now, so there's around 26 million users on Arduino CC, half a million forum users, and the software tools, the IDE, is downloaded over 12 million times per second. So the community around Arduino is vast. Uh, I would certainly say the largest IoT platform out there. And, and the interesting thing for us is this user, user um, group split into three quite nicely. And so Arduino has segmented its product range accordingly. And in terms of our revenue split, uh, split sorry, professional users account for around 30%. Uh, and this sometimes surprises people. What we find is because our tools are easy to use, they're also fast to use by professionals. And often the professionals will not necessarily be in embedded electronics specifically, oftentimes people in embedded electronics have their own preferred development tools or, or boards, uh, although sometimes they use Arduino as well, but also professionals who are coming from areas like mechanical engineering, industrial design, people that are trying to uh, compose systems where they don't want to have to build up from the ground up uh, specific microcontroller boards and things that are really just performing one function in part of a larger system. And this is where Arduino helps them get things done. And so in terms of IoT, it's a term which is being banded around uh, a lot, of course, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think, in general, we'll say it's digitizing the physical world to automate decisions and actions, I think, is a good general uh, catch-all for it. But of course, once you've done that, once you're getting data from all these sources and you're acting on stuff automatically, security and privacy become very important. And so I think these are kind of the two sides of the coin. And, and we really want to enable people to be able to build, build these systems easily, but we want to make sure that the security is built in as standard as well. And so in terms of what Arduino offer, we have a large amount of documentation and examples, which we'll, we'll show you a little bit about later on. We have these development tools, which are free to download and are open source. We have a new range of hardware, the MKR family, which allows you to deploy into smaller systems. And then we have the 
IoT cloud and a whole host of libraries to help you connect to internet-based services with that hardware. So really, we span all of this. And what we're focused on is making it as quick as possible to get your solution working with it. And so the IoT cloud I mentioned is, is, is in beta right now. And what this is, is a, a codeless or all low code way of designing an IoT system using widgets. So you can, using the web dashboard on, on create.arduino.cc, you can put in different uh, widgets for sliders, for, for switches. You effectively are defining the properties of your device, and then you can remotely monitor and control that device. The nice thing about this flow is, as I said, it's, it's very low code. In fact, it will provision certificates, it will secure the connection, it will write the majority of the code automatically for you, which makes it very quick to get a system up and running. One further nice thing about this is it also then has webhooks. So you're not limited to just IoT Cloud in Arduino, you can then connect it onto any web service that you'd like to. So if you have any you know, cloud-based business systems or you know, Google spreadsheets or help desk tickets, all kinds of things can be automated through this process. And so, you know, I've talked about the fact we've got a large number of developers out there using Arduino. We've got a whole host of hardware. We've got a lot of examples and building blocks to help people create these systems. And this is what we're going to be talking about throughout this talk. So let's get into the MKR family. So this is the uh, microcontroller family, which we are launching a kit with Diselec. Uh, around and this is based on this form factor. So the MKR is all in this form factor. Each one of them is certified, has a large range of connectivity options. So you've got microcontroller and a Wi-Fi module or a microcontroller and a cellular module, but they're interchangeable. Uh, they have a LiPo battery charger, uh, sorry, so a connector for a LiPo battery and the circuitry to manage the charging of that battery. Each of them has a secure element, and this is really important for uh, both accelerating those crypto functions and storing keys in a secure way when you're doing communications over the internet. And they're all based on the Cortex M0 based processor. So they have a, a microchip 80 SAM D21, uh, which is a 32 bit processor. So this is more performant than an Arduino Uno by a large margin. And I talked about composability. Of course, Arduino is an Italian company. We like to use the analogy of a sandwich. So in effect, you can take these microcontroller boards, you can add shields, which have sensors or they have um, connect, local connection to CAN or Ethernet or other um, systems. And there's carriers that you can put them on top of either to control um, relays, motors, or add other sensors. And so by stacking these together and putting them in the closure, you have a very quick and easy way of creating a physical uh, and customized IoT sensor node. And this is the, the family of devices, the MKR family of devices I was speaking about earlier on. And you can see if we go from the left-hand side to the right, we've got the 1000, which is a Wi-Fi based module, the Fox, which is SIGFOX, uh, WAN, which is LoRa, the GSM module, which is 3G and 2G fallback, and the NKRNB, which is MBIoT and CATM1. So all of these boards have the microcontroller on them, and next to them, they have a, con uh, a connectivity module. And really, depending on your application, what's, you know, what's appropriate for the situation. If you're somewhere that has Wi-Fi, you can use Wi-Fi. If you're somewhere re remote doing agriculture or something that you know, isn't, in field and not clear to a Wi-Fi hotspot, clearly you do look at stuff like um, Sigfox LoRa or Narrowband IoT. So depending on your application, there's something in the same form factor which will fit and has connectivity that suits you. I should also mention, of course, that for LoRa, we also have a gateway for this. So if you don't have LoRa coverage or you want to create your own gateway, we have something with, um, which is available now through Diselect 2 if you want to connect up to the, the network. Dominic, I, sh I should just add as well, one of the main benefits of the MKR family, the fact that they have the, the standard format means according to which connectivity option you require, you can basically swap out a board as simply as changing two or three lines of code 
and then swap between the um, appropriate connectivity according to the environment. Yeah, absolutely. So not only are they modular in terms of hardware, the software libraries are, are very similar in their API style. So actually, as you say, with a couple of lines of code, you can swap between Wi-Fi and cellular, for example. So I mentioned the MKR OT Prime bundle. I don't know, Keith, if you want to talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, so just very interestingly, this is being launched today through Distrolect. It's exclusive to them, um, global exclusivity by Distrolect. And the interesting piece is it's really the perfect starter kit to um, getting going with IoT. We've used our latest board, so the MKR Wi-Fi 1010. It also comes with the MKR M Shield and the MKR Relay Proto Shield um, with all the other appropriate accessories. Over and above the hardware, just to get you really started, it also comes with six different projects. The first two really being focused on sending the data from the M, M Shield to Telegram and Blink. So it's giving you a number of kind of scenarios, projects to get you used to how would you design an IoT solution. So really, if you're at the, the, the start of your journey in IoT, we'd highly recommend this bundle for you. Very nice. And actually, I saw that the, well, because the MKR 1010 is using, I think it's the Ublox Nina module, which has an ESP32 inside, we have the latest firmware version for that, which actually enables Bluetooth as well as on that product. I've been trying with um, WebBLE, where you can actually get that device connected directly to a web browser on an Android phone or laptop running Chrome. So it's, um, it is really quite a cool little board. Okay, so as we were describing there, this is the, the fundamental architecture of it. You can see that each of them has a different connectivity module on board, but the same microcontroller. And as Keith mentioned, you know, the libraries really abstract the, the detail of the configuration of these um, comms modules from the user. So really you're just instantiating them with a very high level um, bit of code. And to swap between Wi-Fi and GSM is very easy. Actually, most of the time you'd be using HTTP or MQTT or some other kind of transport library. And so swapping between connectivity, whichever is appropriate, is quite straightforward. And for each of these boards, there's a really nice set of reference libraries available on the Arduino website. So we'll take a look, little bit of more of a look at the software flow for this thing after the Shields one. So we talked about Paninis. We talked about the fact that you make a sandwich effectively. Um, the MKR baseboards are the ones with the microcontroller and the connectivity modules. Then we have Shields. Um, and beneath them, we have the, the carrier board. So I believe in the case of the, the, the prime bundle there, the relay shield, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and so you can see there's the, the headers there where you would mount the MKR board, and then you can control um, using the relays all types of um, external electrical components you'd want to connect there. We also have other carrier shields. So we've got the motor carrier and the connector carrier. The connector carrier you can see is a Grove-like shield where you could connect either digital or analog sensors using those, those headers there. Um, so these guys are the, the NKR shields. So they're in the smaller form factor. They fit on the, the top or indeed the bottom of an MKR board. The one that you'll get in the, the prime bundle is the MKR M shield. So this is temperature, humidity, and pressure. I think there's also a light um, detector in there as well. The shield also has an SD socket for, for data logging. So you can, of course, transmit uh, to the internet, or you may want to log on to an SD card if you, know, you want some offline backup or if you think connectivity may be spotty in that place. But also we have things like the MKR485 shield. So if you wanted to connect to, uh, for example, Modbus, uh, DNX lighting, this type of thing, uh, that kind of shield comes in really handy. We have the MKR CAN shield for automotive type uh, systems. We have the Ethernet shield. And finally, we have the, the MEM shield, 
this one has a, a pretty big prototyping area, so you can actually create your own um, peripherals on top of it. So here's a, a bit more of a look at the, the CAN shield. I think the interesting th thing for me is the type of applications that these have been used in. I'm just going to skip a little bit. Actually, I don't think, I think I've lost the slide with this in. That's a shame. Oh, there it is. So we have a customer who's using the CAN shield to interface to um, agricultural machinery. And actually, combined with Laura, what they're doing is they're, I think they're doing some detection of, um, different ID cards of drivers and checking they're authorized to use the machine and, and effectively can, can lock it if it's not the right person. So that's by combining the, the MKR, LoRa, so that's the 1300 plus the, the CAN shield to interface to the local machine. Um, we have an application example, it's an agricultural one, um, and they're using the MKR M shield, so the same shield that's in that bundle, plus in this case, Sigfox to monitor. And I wanted to say this was a pear farm. I don't remember exactly the type of produce, but monitoring the soil temperature, humidity, um, and growth of the, of the produce. I think that the important thing here is it's not just a straight measurement of sensor data. There are certain predictions that can be made. Obviously, you know, a lot of talk about machine learning and the types of insights that you can get from it. In the case of, of this particular one, I believe there's some you know, pest or some blight for the crop that could be predicted based on temperature patterns, for example. So actually, just as you have predictive maintenance, and we do have a predictive maintenance example here, you can detect or predict a failure case before it happens. In the case of the fruit, you can go and spray to prevent the pest. We also have one here where they're using, this is you know, several hundred tons of rock crushing machinery uh, using an Arduino MKR GSM, so this is the 2G, 3G version, and the RS-485 shield. And what they're doing is, I think, measuring temperature and pressure of oil fluids. Uh, and again, it's a predictive algorithm they run on it. So, you know, instead of the machine going down or breaking down, they're able to anticipate problems and go and fix them ahead of time. And this yeah. type of system... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say... Um, Dominic, so the benefit, what they've been able to do there is move away from calendar-based maintenance, which when you start thinking of an oil change, lubricant change for machinery of this scale, they're actually starting initially to be reactive, but then as the data builds up over a number of years, it turns into a, if you like, predictive and a proactive solution. So yeah, you know, I think that's a lot of money and probably more important when you're looking at things of this scale, massively reduce it downtime for maintenance. Exactly. And I think, you know, in general, IoT systems tend to be moving from this static-based approach to a more dynamic one. You know, I've heard of cases where, you know, trucks that are, are rolling, going to collect garbage or refuel propane tanks, instead of having fixed routes, they have real-time sensor data back, optimizing those routes, making sure that, you know, both the systems or the garbage cans are empty or the propane tanks are full, but also making sure they reduce the amount of fuel the trucks use to go and service all of these points. So in general, I think IoT is very powerful in, you know, basically cost optimizing, reducing downtime in, in a whole load of different situations. And it's nice to see that by using this Panini approach, just taking, you know, one connectivity module and one, um, one of the uh, local connectivity solutions, they can quickly retrofit stuff. So th these aren't, in this case, new hardware systems, but they are creating new applications. Okay, so we've had a look at a few of the applications that the hardware have been used in. Let's talk a little bit about developing software um, for Arduino. So you know, I mentioned already, there are experienced embedded engineers who may choose to use C directly or maybe for speed of use would like to use Arduino in some cases. Um, oftentimes we see all types of, you know, looking at the applications we just saw, people in agriculture, mechanical engineering, other fields that really understand their application and want to, you know, create a bit more value or want to do things a bit more efficiently. And Arduino is providing them a way to do it. Um, it's very simple to get started with Arduino. In fact, you don't have to 
even download any tools. If you go to create.arduino.cc and sign up, there's actually a free online editor for the Arduino software. The nice thing about this is all the libraries are up to date. Um, once you're in there, examples for your hardware are really just a couple of button presses away. So this is really nice. You design in your web editor, you connect your board through USB, uh, compile in the cloud and, and the image comes down. Of course, not everyone wants to do stuff in the cloud and if you don't, then you're also welcome to download the desktop IDE um, from the link which is in the middle there. And finally, for more advanced users, we have command line tools. So instead of having a graphical interface, you can then um, interact with this directly using well, batch commands or, or, or any way you'd want. You can put this on the back of other IDEs, which is the very interesting thing about it. And we're seeing people increasingly do this. So these are the three ways of, of getting developing with Arduino, kind of easy to hard, I would say. And then once you have your product, I'm talking about the, the case of the Wi Fi 1010, we have a whole load of resource on the Arduino.cc website. Um, you can see here basically the web page will, will step you through exactly what I just described there. Um, and really important is the code examples, and there are a whole host of these. In fact, you know, we mentioned the fact that the, the 1010 has the Wi Fi module from Ublocks, the Nina. So if you go on the Arduino libraries page and look at Nina, you can see there are you know, 20 different example sketches. And the gap between what these provide and what you use are actually is often um, quite small. So this provides a really nice starting point. So you, you'll get a result very quickly. So to see these examples, you either go to the web page. Actually, when you have the IDE on the menu, if you do file and examples, you can just click on one of the examples and it will come up and you can compile it immediately. And if you want to look into GitHub, then they're also available there too. And so here's me diving into one specific example. I wouldn't, you know, you don't really need to spend too much time considering this other than the fact that the code is there for you. Um, you can see at the top, you're bringing in some libraries. Wi-Fi Nina is one of them. HTTP client is another. Secrets. Uh, is actually just where you put your Wi-Fi username and password. We're encouraging anyone to split out any of this private information from their main code, because often it's shared either with uh, colleagues or online. Um, and the thing I'm trying to illustrate here is you can see we've set a port to 80, we've set the client there. To do this securely actually is only a two line change. So as we said before, security is something we wanna make as easy as possible. And to do this with Arduino is very straightforward. And just as um, Keith said, you know, we mentioned um, swapping from Wi-Fi to cellular is straightforward. Both of these examples are available to you um, free now on the links I showed you before. But just to illustrate, you know, moving between Wi-Fi and cellular, the difference is actually just that. Now you're having to put in, so I've moved from the Wi-Fi to the cellular example. Now you're instancing MKR GSM instead of Nina. You're putting in a PIN number for your SIM card and the APN details for your SIM, which will be provided to you by wherever you got your SIM from. So this is the only part that would actually change. The HTTP client remains the same. And so if you're doing stuff online, which you often will be through you know, an IoT system, um, most of that code will stay the same. So this is the secrets tab I mentioned. And so what we're doing here is we're splitting out a PIN number an APN and the login and password for, for a cellular SIM in this case. And so at the bottom of that type of sketch, what you'd be doing is um, either some MQTT or HTTP requests. This is a GET. Um, so what we're doing here is we're loading a web page through the internet and printing out the response. And this is a standard library that you'll see um, through the links I provided. And all that happens is it loads a web page. And so this is an HTTP GET. Obviously. Um, when you're doing some IoT systems, you might be doing either MQTT um, publishing or you might be doing REST API calls. And so if you wanted to use a REST API, so you know, an API for a, a cloud service, for example, all you need to do is change a couple of lines, specify you know, weather map or, or whatever server you're using and the path or the API name, and then you'll get a response back. And one thing I'll say is again, we have examples for all this stuff. You don't have to start from scratch. 
And there are some very nice libraries that have just been made available um, for processing JSON. So you can see that data has come back in the JSON format, um, OAuth or um, client libraries. So we'll show these a bit, a bit later on, but actually dealing with this kind of data is very straightforward on Arduino. So I wanted to touch quickly on security. So we mentioned each one of the boards has uh, a secure chip, so as a crypto authentication chip. It can store the keys um, internally in, in that crypto chip as acceleration for performing um, all types of cryptography algorithms and a real, real um, sorry, a random number generator on board as well. And we've made libraries so actually, you know, this stuff again is abstracted from you. You don't have to um, delve into it too much but it is there and we were enabling you to do certificate based authentication. So instead of doing a username and password, you have a, a strong um, key for doing this instead. And I mentioned already, you know, using SSL or TLS instead of clear text in your sketch is very straightforward. And also, you know, we, we hired a chief information security officer at the beginning of this year and he's published this policy. Um, you know, security is an ongoing challenge for the whole industry. And, uh, you know, sometimes there can be vulnerabilities or problems discovered with any number of components in any system. And our policy is to be as transparent about this as possible and address those um, issues if they arise as quickly as possible. And so if you want to see a bit more about that policy, you can have a look here. So we've talked about the components, the microcontrollers, the sensors, how you develop the code. Let's talk about connecting to the cloud a little bit. And again, I think there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, the easiest way I would say is using the Arduino IoT cloud. And in fact, we'll see this in, in a couple of um, slides. Provisioning your board in that uh, Distrelect bundle is very straightforward. You connect through USB and there's a a web-based interface to put the, the certificates and keys on that board. Um, and then you can monitor and control it remotely. Um, there's services like Dweet or ThingSpeak, which are designed for this type of thing as well, which are quite nice. And finally, we have all the libraries I mentioned and examples for the likes of um, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. So let's talk about this a little bit quickly. Um, so if you go to create.arduino.cc, you will see um, this, and Arduino Cloud is the IoT platform that we have in beta today. If you connect your board to it using USB, we have a device manager which will, behind the scenes, provision it and make it secured and ready to connect to the cloud. You can then stick in different properties, so if your Arduino device has uh, you know, a relay connected to a lamp and a temperature sensor, for example, you can um, simply do this using the widget editor right here. Um, you can see a couple of things. There's a Boolean type for the lamp. It's an on-off. Um, there's a temperature in Celsius for the sensor. The update item is very important. So, you know, you can choose how often you want it to update. For the lamp, we want updates as soon as the switch is changed. Um, but for the temperature, we're saying only on a certain delta. Now, if you're connecting via cellular data, for example, you may not want um, too much connectivity uh, because you're paying for the megabytes of data. So you might want to do something which only updates every a delta of 0.1 Celsius, for example, as is shown here. So these properties can be added through, through the interface. And then when you hit edit code, it automatically um, generates the code and puts you into the online ID so you can then complete it. This is the view version, so I should show here, this is the edit version, so you're adding these properties, and then you have the ability to view them. Once your device is then online, you can control using the lamp widget or you can see the temperature live in this widget here. And this is a very basic example. You have a whole load of other widgets that you can use. Um, and the, the final thing I'd say is, it doesn't end here, you also have the ability to either use webhooks to bridge out into other web services, or even for more advanced developers, some APIs if you wish to uh, connect to that data directly. And if you're familiar with an Arduino sketch, the nice thing about it is actually uh, the, the code doesn't change too much. So 
we have the Arduino cloud update. You've specified a couple of variables which will be monitored remotely and the sketch will then sync to the cloud and allow you to either view those updated or change them via the cloud through that function. As I mentioned, so Arduino IoT Cloud is definitely not the only way you can uh, connect these devices. I, the one really nice thing I think about the MKR family is with the older versions of Arduino, you needed additional shields, you needed additional services, but with Arduino MKR 1010 or any of that family, you can connect them directly to any web-based service. These devices can support um, HTTP, TLS, OAuth, they've got JSON libraries. Really, if there's a web service you'd like to connect to, you're more than likely going to be able to do it. And we have full examples for AWS IoT, Azure IoT Hub, and Google's Cloud Platform IoT. And you can either install these through your IDE. So in the library manager, you have this little box here, and you can just press install. Um, or if you wish, you can have a look on GitHub. I provided the link below. But what I should say is there is examples for each of these platforms. And then against each platform, we have examples for Wi-Fi, GSM, and narrowband. So in other words, if you want to get started with one of these, we've made it as simple as possible too. OK. So hopefully, um, I've given you a, a taste of how you can get to a working project in just a few minutes using the tools and um, examples that we've provided with Arduino. And this um, bundle we described is a really nice way to get started. So all the questions in the video will be available on the Distrolec know-how hub. And that's a wrap from me. I don't know, Keith, have you got any, any final words? No, I was just going to say thank you, Dominic, for a very um, comprehensive overview. Um, I'd say just think of it that Arduino provides the complete platform solution for your, your IoT prototyping right through to production. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. And have a great day.